A Cessna Centurion down in Lubbock and the Navy loses a Texan trainer on taking off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and this is my aviation rant of the week with some news that can hopefully make us better pilots and better people. Going to talk quickly about the Navy Texan II crash in Florida and then get to the key thing today, the icy crash of a Centurion two days ago in Lubbock, Texas. Let's get to it. On Friday in Florida, a Texan II T-6B crashed in a neighborhood, killing both the instructor and the student. The plane was out of Whitting Field and crashed near a school. Fortunately, no people on the ground were harmed. The Navy is asking for anyone with footage, surveillance cameras, or any information to contact them. An unconfirmed eyewitness states the plane went to a spin before hitting the ground and exploding. Killed in the crash was a Navy lieutenant and the student was an ensign in the Coast Guard. Our hearts go out to their families. The cause of the crash has not been determined and I'm not going to speculate. The field has been closed for several days as they investigate, and it's going to be some time before the Navy releases their findings. Lieutenant Rhiannon Ross was known for her infectious smile and positive attitude, and the 24-year-old Ensign Morgan Garrett was living her dream. The aviation community has lost some bright stars. Some things about the Texan II. It's manufactured by Beechcraft and has a PT-6 turboprop engine. The speed maxes out at near 350 knots and it's been used since 2001. The plane has had some known issues with its environmental systems, uh, issue actually called unexplained physiological event due to hypoxia and something I've never heard of before, hypercapnia, which turns out is when you have too much carbon dioxide in your blood. The T-6 fleet was grounded in 2018 until a series of fixes were rolled out. And my first thought was, hypoxia near ground level? And the answer is yes. These cockpits are pressurized and the wrong atmosphere can lead to some bad things. But was that the case in Friday's crash? At this stage, don't rule anything out, but probably unlikely. Just, just some background on the plane. And now a crash that hits close to home, literally. The crash happened near where I live and involved the same model plane I fly. I was flying uh, near Lubbock back home to Fort Worth in my Centurion, a 1980 November model on Sunday night before the weather turned nasty. We had temps near 90 and hadn't had a real cold spell yet, but we all knew a freeze was on the way. Farmers were winterizing their spray rigs and getting everything in shape, and that was Sunday evening. The weather hit and the Texas Panhandle got its first freeze of the season with moisture, freezing rain, sleet, and plenty of ice. That was Sunday night into Monday. A pilot in New Mexico flying a newly purchased Cessna Centurion, the 1960 early model, flew across country in this weather from Berlin Municipal to Lubbock, a Clash Charlie airport. And he crashed in IMC into an East Lubbock neighborhood and was fatally injured. Okay, we don't know yet at the time of this recording who the pilot was. The registration lists the owner, but that owner owns like 20 planes. Not sure yet who was actually flying. So in spite of social media speculation, we don't know the pilot's currencies or ratings. The plane was recently purchased in August, and before that, earlier this year in February, the plane had a front gear failure on landing with significant damage. I mean, news at the time was that the plane was written off. So Monday, the weather was bad, really bad. Uh, the airport weather, the METAR, at the time of the accident was winds 02015, gusting 21. Visibility was four statute miles. They were reporting overcast 700 feet with freezing drizzle. For those non pilots out there, this is some of the worst stuff you can fly through. It can coat your control surfaces quickly and heavily, build up on your wings, causing a loss of lift. Even if you have anti ice and de icing capabilities, it's simply nasty. And that was the weather. It was a long cross country. He filed IFR. He was up for almost four hours. And I know uh, my Centurion, a later model with a different engine, I can go about five and a half hours depending on conditions, which takes us to the plane, a 1960 Centurion. In the late 50s, Cessna took a 182 and worked on making it bigger. So still only a four seater with the early model with wing struts and a 260 horsepower engine. We don't know what the avionics were like, but the pilot did have trouble on the approach. He was coming in on the RNAV Yankee 
three-five left approach. And when cleared for the approach, to me, he sounded either confused or work saturated. And confused because he got cleared for a different approach than what he was expecting. Here's the ATC audio. We're here in two two tango, nine and a half miles from the runway threshold. Turn left heading zero two zero. Maintain five thousand two hundred till south for the final approach course. Go down at Yankee runway three five left approach. Uh, we heading again, please. Left heading zero two zero. Two zero. That was the uh, one seven right approach, correct? No, three five left. Yeah, three five left approach. Uh, the R N F Yankee three five left. Can you tell me what my next uh, is it to Tango? Can you tell me what my next is it to Tango? Would be? Tango, you're coming up towards the uh, Ufasi. That's the final approach six, and you are cleared for the R N F Yankee three five left approach uh, once established. Roger, uh, I'm getting. Okay, can you just give me back this, please? One thing pretty obvious, uh, he was expecting a different runway, and I'm speculating, but he perhaps had briefed the incorrect plate. Also, he wasn't reading back the clearance. You can hear ATC gently reminding him he was cleared for the approach, waiting for him to repeat the clearance, but he never did. So he was on top of the final approach fix, trying to figure it out when ATC gave him the option to go around, which he took. So approach took him east for a second try. And this time he had the right plate and identified the correct nav points. It was at this point ATC asked him about icing and he replied, That's affirmative. Okay. Freezing rain. Freezing rain and uh, what's the outside air temperature? Outside air temperature looks like it's uh, 10 degrees Celsius. Negative 10 or positive 10? He reports 10 degrees, but never answers the clarification, plus or minus. Another pilot chimes in that he had icing at minus 3 for the first 2,000 feet. And it's possible to have icing at 10 degrees Celsius, but, but unlikely. Really, the Goldilocks zone is 5 degrees to minus 5 degrees. And at this point, the pilot knows that icing is from 5,300 feet MSL down to the surface. That's 2,000 feet AGL. The approach starts at 5,200 feet. That's merely 100 feet into the icing. If he's picking up this kind of icing, he can climb 100 feet and get out of it. But I know from that day, there were no good options with his fuel reserves. The entire area was blanketed with this freezing rain level from ground to 2,000 AGL. He was now in a real jam. So what would you do at this point? Climb up and out of the icing, but then what? Leave comments below for what you would choose at this point. For me, it's definitely time to climb out of the icing and declare an emergency. Take a deep breath and consider the options. How bad is the current icing? How much fuel is remaining? Is there anywhere within distance that does not have icing? I'd ask the ATC for help with that if I didn't have a good answer. Sure, at this point, I'd be kicking myself for not seeing this coming. But I would need to get myself out of the situation first. The condemnation can and will come later. If this plane had Fiki, fly into known ice capabilities, it would have been aftermarket. The original 210 did not have that. What this means is that if the plane was not Fiki, he should not have even attempted this landing. And by 4 p.m. on Monday in Lubbock, they'd had the condition for hours. If it were me, as I studied the weather en route from New Mexico, I would have diverted way back when I had other options. But we don't know what was going on. So back to the second approach. This time he acknowledges the approach clearance and gets set up correctly. But his speed drops. ATC sequences a 737 behind him, telling the Southwest jet that the Centurion is at 70 knots, so slow down. But by the way, here's the standard numbers on landing my model Centurion. 90 on final, 80 short final, 70 over the numbers. But with an ice buildup, standard numbers need to be increased. And more about that in a minute. Of course, ATC is looking at ground speed. And with a 17 knot quartering headwind, his true airspeed was probably a dozen knots or so faster. But he was slow. And when the Centurion slows to 50 knots over the ground, Tower instructs him to go around with an immediate turn 
and I'm a little confused because it sounded like right turn to 270 when he was on a 350 path. Left turn would make sense. Centurion 2 2 Tango turn right hitting 270. Then the tower followed up with a right turn eastbound instruction. For Centurion 2 2 Tango fly eastbound, climb and maintain 5200. At this point, they give the go-around to the overtaking Southwest jet and they lose radar contact. The evidence points to an icing buildup, but we don't know yet if that's for sure. But as I like to do in these reports, let's see what we can take away to make us better pilots and better people. First of all, I have been caught in a sticky situation because of inadequate planning. It's imperative that I take the time to check out the destination and not just figuring it out in the air, which I have been known to do in full transparency. Monday, sitting in the FBO in New Mexico, the weather conditions were no surprise. There wasn't a fast moving system or a sudden buildup. I knew it was coming Sunday afternoon and timed my departure out of the area before it could get cold and I still landed in Fort Worth Sunday evening when it was already IMC to 300 feet, just not cold yet. Plan better. And for when I do screw up, what can I do? Missing an approach in IMC is stressful. <laughs> I've done that. It was a, probably a good call to take that miss, but it also left him in the ice longer. Let's talk about what to do when in this situation when you're picking up ice. First thing, get out of the icing. So initiate that climb. Secondly, make sure all de-ice or anti-icing equipment is on. If you don't have a lot, you probably have something. Pedo heat, window defroster, carb heat if equipped. For my Centurion, with Fiki, I have leading edge inflatable boots, prop heater, and window heater. Here's other things. Plan on keeping your airspeed 10 or 15 knots faster, especially on the landing. You've got to build up on your wings, which reduces your lift and increases your stall speed. If your plane normally stalls at 50, now it might stall at 60 with an ice buildup. Keep that speed up. Consider landing without flaps. Icing on the flaps can actually lead to a tail stall. But above all, and I can't stress this enough, avoid the ice. Don't fly in it. So that's all I have right now, as always, and especially in light of this accident. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skill. So stay safe.